Good morning, Hustle Church. It's good to be with you this morning, and uh, I thank you for, for joining us. I did want to just take a moment before we get into some other things and just to tell you that I love you and I miss seeing you. There's something special that happens when we gather together and we, we sing and we hear each other's voices and we encourage each other and we greet one another and just fellowship. And I miss that. And I know it's wonderful to go to our Zoom meetings and Bible studies and growth groups, but there's something special about just being together. And uh, I just want to thank you for praying for me, praying for our staff. We are continuing to work, and I just do want to say thank you for giving financially and supporting us at this time. I learned this last week that some 22 million filed for unemployment checks, and that's an awful lot of people. And we know that many of you out there today have have lost your jobs or are not getting incomes right now. And I just wanted to let you know, we pray for you. I pray for you every day. And it's not just that you would be able to survive, that we, you can cross this off your bucket list, that you survive the pandemic of 2020, but rather that you would thrive and that you would thrive spiritually, that you would take advantage of opportunities to share Christ's love and, and trust him during this very unique time. And so before I get into my message, I just want to have a word of prayer for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the people who are tuning in this morning and for those who uh, are looking to you and trusting you and those that are struggling right now, maybe they're doubting. And Lord, whatever the situation, Lord, I just want to pray that you would bless them and encourage them. Lord, you know the needs that are represented in our church family, and all those who are tuning in, and whatever the need is, Lord, would you, would you please just encourage them? Wrap your arms around them. Let them know they're not alone. And, and work on their behalf to strengthen them and to meet their every need. I, just, uh, I thank you for this, this church family that is stuck together, even though we're sheltering in place. And I pray for each one. Now, Lord, as we just look into your word, would you open our minds and our hearts to receive what is true. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, did a little more research, more research this last week. Last week I was talking about Barna Research Group, and I have some more statistics for you. And the first statistic that I came across was that 88% of Americans own a Bible. In that same study, they found that 80% of Americans say that the Bible is sacred. So 88% of Americans own a Bible, and 80% of them say that the Bible is sacred. Now, I looked up the word sacred, and it simply means connected with God in, in a special way. And so I was thinking, you know, the problem in America is not that we don't have Bibles. Nine and ten do. Nor is it the fact that we don't believe that the Bible is a special revelation from God because 8 and 10 believe that. The problem is not that we don't have Bibles. The problem is that we don't really even know what's in the Bible. As, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of things that people think are in the Bible that are not even in the Bible at all. And I thought this morning, I'd just give you a few of those, that most people think are in the Bible but it's not in the Bible at all. The first one is that is this, that God helps those who help themselves. A lot of people say, you've probably heard people say, well, as the Bible says, God helps those who help themselves. Actually, that is not in the Bible at all. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. God helps those who can't help themselves, who don't help themselves. He helps them. Not in the Bible. This, the second thing that is not in the Bible is uh, the phrase that says that God works in mysterious ways. A lot of people believe that that's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. No, probably there's some of you right now who are, are going to check out. And you're not going to hear another word I'm going to say for the rest of the morning because you're going to be in your Bibles trying to find that passage where it says God works in mysterious ways. You can look from Genesis to Revelation. You're not going to find it. Now, we do know that God's, how he works, he does work in ways that we don't understand, but nowhere in Scripture is that phrase found. The third thing that is, many people think is in the Bible that's not is that God won't give you more than you can handle. I've heard that said so many times. Oh, I'm so grateful the Bible says that God will not give me more than I can handle. Actually, that's not in the Bible. 
Uh, I, I think that uh, guys like Job and uh, guys like the Apostle Paul, they'd probably come along and say, man, oh, I disagree with that. God has many, many times given me more than I can handle. And uh, nowhere does it say that. The Bible does say in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that God will not tempt us beyond what we're able. He won't give us a temptation beyond what we're able to stand up against. Because with the temptation, he says, I'm always going to provide a way of escape. But nowhere does it say anywhere in Scripture that God won't give us more than we can handle. The, the fourth thing that many people think is in the Bible is that cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I happen to be a strong proponent of showers and baths, uh, especially if you're a junior high boy. Uh, I happen to have been a youth pastor. Junior high boys just have a very distinct, unique aroma about them. And so I, I think it's a good thing. Now, that's a good principle, but nowhere in Scripture does it say that cleanliness is next to godliness. Another thing that people will many times say is this. Money is the root of all evil. Actually, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. All kinds of problems come with that. And so what we find is that many times Americans own Bibles. They believe that it's sacred, but they don't know what's in it. And one of the reasons why Jesus followers have a particularly difficult time going through COVID-19, this coronavirus, and they experience worry and frustration and they experience anxiety and stress is because they don't know what's inside this book. They don't know what's in the Bible. And so this morning, we want to figure out if we can't learn some more about who God is. Now, a couple weeks ago, I put something up on the screen. I'm going to put it up there again today, and it says this. The more you know about God, the more you can trust God in the unknown. I'll say that again. The more you know about God, the more you can trust God in the unknown. Let me put it another way. The less you know about God, the less likely you're going to be able to trust Him when life gets really hard and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So God's given us His Word. We're in the middle of a series called Unshakable Promises, Unmovable Truths During Shaky Times. And we want to continue that study this morning. And uh, today I want to look at a promise that is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time at all, you've probably know this verse. Maybe you've memorized it. Uh, there's been times in your life that you've run to this verse and maybe you embraced it and hugged it and said, oh man, do I need to hear this verse? And I want you to hear what it says here from the text. It says this, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What an incredible promise. I love how it starts. And we know and we know this promise. It's, it's a glorious, wonderful promise. And again, if you've been walking with Christ any length of time at all, you know this, this passage. It, it, the problem is, is that people, even though they read the passage, they, they try to interpret it in a way that it's never meant to, to be interpreted. And so the first thing I want to do this morning is I want to be able to tell you and look at what this promise does not say. We're going to look at what this promise does not, does not say. The first thing that it does not say is this, that God causes all things. Many people will go to the text and they will say, oh, there it is. God causes all things. And then they just stop right there. No, it doesn't stop there. And God causes all things to work together for good. And so if you misunderstand, interpret this passage, what you do is you end up blaming God. God causes all things. No, does God does not cause all things. The second misunderstanding that we have, what this promise does not say, is this, that everything is good. Many have a hard time wrapping their minds around this particular promise because what they are experiencing today, what they're experiencing in their life, and maybe since birth, is not good. And they say, that can't, this is a bad thing. God does not cause everything to work together for good. Not everything is good. 
That's right. It's not intended to be. Now, God, when God created the world, what he did is he made it good. He said, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. God, this world was good. The problem was, is that man chose to go against God's divine design. We call it sin. And when mankind, humanity, sinned, this world was broken in a very significant way. And because this world is broken, there is many things in this world that are not good. There is bad stuff in this broken world. Right now, there is this global pandemic. And let me tell you something, this coronavirus, this COVID-19 is not good. Don't, I don't care what anybody else tells you, it is not good. It is a consequence of the broken world that we live in because of our rejection of God's divine design. The second thing we have to realize is that not only is there bad stuff in the world, there's sad stuff in this world. There's many of you who are struggling with circumstances. I have things in my life that are very, very sad. There, there is a great deal of sadness in this world. There's death, there's divorce, there's depression, there's disappointment and disease, even as we're learning. The third thing is that there is challenging stuff in this broken world. Many of you are facing circumstances that you were not prepared to face. Many of you lost your jobs. Many of you are being uh, home uh, school parents. And all these things are calling, causing you a lot of stress. And they're challenging times, to be sure. Finances, challenging stuff. And there's also evil stuff in this broken world. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of bad people. Matter of fact, even right now, there's people who are trying to scam you out of your money. And they're preying upon the vulnerable. They're preying upon those who are fearful. And there's a lot of evil stuff in this world as well. Th this promise that we're looking at is not a promise that everything is good. It's not good. This promise is not that God causes all things either. The third thing that this promise does not say is that everything works out for good for everybody. That's not what this verse is saying at all. People may quote the verse as kind of a karma or maybe as a mantra or some sort. Everything does not work out for everybody's good. That's not what the verse says. Look at the verse again. It says this, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who, to who? To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This promise is conditional. It's, it's not a promise for all people. It's a promise for those who are a part of God's family, who are children of God, who have placed their faith and trust, who believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. This is a promise. It is not a, a maybe. It is an absolute guarantee. Matter of fact, the word there, uh, called, is actually can be translated invite. God invited you into his family through faith in Jesus. And those of you who've received that, invitation, acted on that invitation, are now part of the family. And this is a promise that is for you. No ifs, ands, or buts. That's why Paul says, we can know. It's a statement of absolute certainty in the truth that you, because you belong to, to Christ. Now, all of this promise, all the, uh, the promise of Romans 8, 28, it is built upon a foundation that starts all the way up in the beginning of chapter 8 of Romans, uh, chapter 1 of, of Romans 8. And I, I want to walk you through it. Here it goes. In Romans 8, verse 1, it says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This word no in English is a two-letter word. In the Greek, it's actually two words that are put together. The first part of the word is not, and then the second word that is put together, even one. And so when you see that word no, it's actually not even one condemnation is 
charged against those who are followers of Christ, who believe in Jesus. There is now no condemnation. There's not one single solitary thing that makes you guilty before God. Remarkable. You and I are declared innocent. So that's Romans 8, verse 1. A little bit later in Romans 8, verses 15 to 17, we read this. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adopt adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, which is Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs of God and fellow heirs with God. Christ. Now, this is what it means. If you trust Christ, you have been adopted into the family of God. And that's not the end of it. You become a joint heir with Christ. What's that mean? That means that everything that Christ has, all the rights and authority that Christ has, you have as a joint heir with Christ. Because why? You are in him. You're found in him. A little bit later in Romans 8, we come to verse 26 and verse 27, and it says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us with our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we, as we ought, pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit, there's our word again, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit intercedes. Literally, the word uh, uh, intercedes is to plead on behalf of another. So what's this mean? Just in, in these three passages. Number one, you and I are not guilty. That's the foundational truth. The second thing is you and I are joint heirs with Christ. And number th three, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us who is interceding, pleading on our behalf every single moment of the day. Now listen to me. I don't care what you're going through right now. You have, if you're a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit who is pleading on your behalf before God. And this is what causes Paul to say, Go into our text again, and we know what he's saying here. What's taking place in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, is this. It's foundational upon the fact that you're not guilty. You, you are joint heirs with Christ, and you're also, the Holy Spirit is pleading and intervening for you. So listen, that's what we look at. The, the Bible, this, this promise in Romans 8, 28 does not say that God causes all things. It does not say that everything is good, nor does it say that all things work together for good for everybody. So let's go to the second point, which is this. What does the promise then say? Let's read it again. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So the first thing we know about this verse is this, very important, don't miss this, is that God is at work. Right now, in this moment, in the middle of whatever you're facing, Paul says you can know with all certainty that God is at work. Now in the Greek, this word means he is continually at work. He, he never stops working. Do, do you know that, that, that Christ is alive in your life and he is working in your life right now? That's, now, this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus himself says the same thing in John chapter 5, verse 17. It says this, Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. I like what the Amplified Version does in, with this translation. It says, it puts it this way. Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now. He has never ceased working, and I too am working. Now, I, I want to give you three truths very quickly here 
about how God is working. I want you to know, first off, that God is working even when you cannot see it. Sometimes we look at our lives and we look at situations and we say, I can't see him working. I want to assure you that he is working. He never stops working. Even right now with the coronavirus, behind the curtain, behind what you and I can see, there's a God who's working. In Matthew chapter 14, many of you will remember this passage where Jesus had a group of people gather around him. Actually, there's 5,000 people that showed up there. And uh, he'd been preaching and teaching all day, and people are just, you know, just waiting on every word. They're just amazed at his wisdom and his knowledge and the truth that he's sharing. And the disciples are starting to run around, and they're starting to get all panicky, and they don't know what to do because dinner's coming, and they're thinking, how are these people going to, uh, how are we going to feed them, or how are they going to get food? There's no McDonald's around or, Ch or Chick-fil-A. And so well, what do we do? And, and so they're panicking. And you know the story how Jesus took the lunch of a small boy, just a small lunch that had been given to him. And he blessed it and he broke it and he, and he distributed it among all the people and 5,000 people ate that day. And when they were done, they collected 12 baskets. The point is this, the, the disciples didn't see Jesus working, but he was still working. And the truth is, is, that, is that God is working even when you don't see him. Secondly, here's another truth. God is at work when you don't feel it. Some of you are saying, man, I don't feel like God's working. Uh, especially these last couple of weeks, my feelings have kind of gotten overwhelming. A little, I'm overwhelmed by my, my feelings. I've, I've talked to people who are struggling with depression, real depression. They're, they're struggling with frustration. And I'm going to tell you this, God is at work even when you don't feel it. Other than the disciples, probably Jesus' three closest friends were named Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And many times the disciples and Jesus would go, and, and when, anytime they were passing by there, they would always stop in and see Jesus' friends. And uh, they enjoyed great meals together and fellowship and probably times of laughter, just fun friendship stuff. And the story goes, Scripture tells us that Lazarus got very, very sick. And so Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, who was away from the area, and saying, hurry, hurry back, Lazarus is sick. you got to get here before he dies so you can heal him. By the time Jesus gets back to the area, uh, Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. And, and Mary comes out of the house when she finds out Jesus is coming, and she's a little disturbed, and she kind of admonishes Jesus. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And you know the story how Jesus was led over to the tomb, and there he, he cries out, Lazarus, come forth, after the, the stone is rolled away, and, and Lazarus comes back to life. The, the point here is Jesus is working even when you don't feel it. Mary didn't feel it. She didn't feel as if there was going to be a miracle around the corner. She didn't feel it. And one minute, Lazarus is dead, and 30 minutes later, there's this this rambunctious, excitable party that's taken place because Lazarus has come back to life. Remarkable. But the next truth, God is working when you don't see it. God is working when you don't feel it. And thirdly, God is working when you don't expect it. I'm guilty here. There's times that life gets... I see things and I think, I, you know, that may be, I know God could, could do anything. He could bring somebody back to life, but I don't think he can change that situation. And sometimes I don't expect him to be working. You remember the story when in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is there by the Sea of Galilee and he tells Peter, who's been out in his boat fishing all night long, hasn't caught us, hasn't got a nibble, hasn't got a, caught a single fish. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, put your net down on the other side. And so Peter's like, you know, I'm the expert here, Lord. You know, I, I've been, my daddy taught me how to fish. I've been fishing all my life. And uh, we fished all night. It's not going to work. 
but at your bidding, I'll kind of sarcastically almost says, okay, Lord, I'll do it. He lowers down the net. You know what happens? You sure you do. Many of you do. When he pulled up the net, it was bursting with fish. More fish than he caught ever before. You know, that God is working even when we don't expect him to be working. Even when we don't expect him to, to change anything. He's still working. God is at work when we don't see it, when we don't feel it, or we don't expect it. Brings us to our second point. Not only is God at work, but God, secondly, is at work in all things. Here's the text. And we know that God causes all things. God is at work in all things. Now, the word there in the Greek, yeah, the word all actually can mean two different things. One word, the word is, is panta, and it can mean uh, all of a whole, or it can mean all of the individual parts of the, of the whole. And I want you to know that God is at work in the whole of your life. What's this mean? It means this, that there's not one area of your life that is an accident. There's not one part of your life that is out of God's control. He is constantly at work. In Psalm 139, I want to read you some verses. These are just remarkable. Let your mind just kind of center in on these. He says this, the psalmist, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You, you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. <laughs> Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, oh, oh Lord, you know it altogether. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. What's this mean? Listen, listen. That means before you were you. Before you were you, God was at work in you, through you, and all around you. God is at work in the wholeness of your life, but he's not just involved in the whole part of your life. He's also involved in all the details of your life. Not just a few things, all the different areas of your life, everything. Not just the good things, not just the wonderful things, but also the bad things. Not just when the, the, the sun is shining, but when it's raining. Not just when you're on a mountaintop, but also when you're in the valley. Not just when you're happy, but also when you're sad. All things. Listen to me. Listen. God is involved in all things of your life. When John MacArthur was talking on this particular verse in Scripture and talking about all things, that God caused all things. This is what he wrote. He said this, All things is utterly comprehensive, having no qualifications or limits, neither this verse nor its context allows for restrictions or, condi uh, or conditions. I am sorry, but there is no area of your life in which God is not working, convicting you sometimes, encouraging you, strengthening you, working in your life. This is the kind of God that we have. This is remarkable. If you are a child of God, if you have a relationship with him through faith, you have a promise. And it's this, that God is at work in all things God is at work in all things. Now, we're going to get to the third and final point here. Here it is. And this is the best part. God is at work in all things for my good. The text here again says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good 
to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You hear that? You hear that? If you're a child of God, this promise is for you. God does not sleep. He doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't take a nap. He is at work in all areas of your life for your good. The, the Greek word for good is the Greek word agathos. And it means for your benefit, actually for your best. And so even when you're going through the, the valleys of the shadow of death, the God is at work and he's doing things for your good. I can't even tell you how many times when I've gone through hard things, disappointing, sad things, things that make me cry, things that make me hurt. I, I realize this, that God is still working. He hasn't abandoned me. He hasn't forsaken me alongside some road, some, some valley I'm in. And he'll say, well, Rich, I'll pick you up on the other side of the valley. But he is there working in my life and in your life for our good. When you've lost a loved one, he's still working for your good. You've gone through a divorce after a betrayal. He's still working for your good. Something happens. Somebody abused your child. He still wants to use that and work in your life for your good. John MacArthur, again in this passage, says this. No matter what our situation, our suffering, our persecution our sinful failure, just take that in for a minute, no matter how bad we sin, our pain, our lack of faith, because we doubt sometimes, in those things as well as in all other things, listen, our Heavenly Father will work to produce our ultimate victory and blessing. So what's this mean? God is at work. God is at work in all things. And God is at work in all things for my good. So what's that mean? It means this. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning and you claim Romans 8, 28, that all God is at work in all work in all things for your good. You know what that means? If you believe that, you will never get angry. If you claim this, you're never going to get worried. If you claim this, you're never going to become bitter. If you know that God is at work in you and causing all things to work together for your good, you know what? You're not going to be jealous. And you're not going to hold grudges. And you're not going to be fearful. You know why? Because God's at work. Because God is at work in all things. Because God is at work in all things for my good. So here's, here's the challenge for this week. We all have an it. The, the, the thing that is our chief concern, the it, the it that brings us pain, the it that brings us sorrow. Three things. Number one, trust God with it. You say, Rich, how do I do that? You do that by just saying, Lord, I trust you. I, I trust. I surrender myself to you. I, I believe that you're working all things together for good, and I trust you with this process. I trust you with the shelter in place. I trust you with my loss of income. I trust you with, with my concern for my health. I trust you with the stress of trying to be a homeschool teacher. I trust you. The second is thank God for it. 
Trust God with it, number one. Then thank God for it. What's that look like? God, I thank you for it. Because I know you're working through the it in my life for my good. And so instead of just complaining about it, I want to thank you for it. I love you, Lord. I trust you. I love you. And I thank you for it. And then the third thing is to talk to God about it. What's that mean? Lord, I'm struggling. I am anxious. Will you give me the, the courage that I need? The strength? Or I... I the, the it is, is a relationship that's not going well. Lord, will you work in my heart and in their heart to resolve this conflict? Trust God with it. Thank God for it. And then talk to God about it. And I will tell you this. You and I have the privilege of walking boldly Boldly before the throne of grace, before our almighty God. You know why? Because we're joint heirs with Christ. And we have the same privileges that he has. He walks in there, we walk in there with him. And I want you to encourage you to pray. Turn off the television. Walk away from social media. And spend time telling God that you trust him that you thank him and you want to talk with him. I want you to know something about the, when you, as a believer and a follower of Christ, you, you can walk into to God's presence. He's there. He wants to hear from you. I told you a couple weeks back that I was reading a book by Max Lucado, Anxious for Nothing. And uh, he, he makes, there's a quote in there I want to read to you. It says this, God does not delay. God doesn't delay. He never places you on hold or tells you to call again later. God loves the sound of your voice, always. He doesn't hide when you call. He hears your prayers. You pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that in Jesus we have this powerful promise. I thank you for the followers of Jesus today who are listening. And I pray that they would lean into this promise, that they would experience all the benefits that, that you, as they lean into this, prob, this, this promise, that the jealous feelings and all the things, of the, the anxious feelings and being offended and all the, all the rest that mo they might feel would just be removed. I pray, Lord, that you would remind us when we start to get frustrated and start spinning out a little bit about problems, whatever the it is, that we can trust you with it, that we can thank you for it, and we can talk to you about it. And if you're a Christian, just I'm gonna this morning, I'm gonna ask you to just practice those three: trusting God with it, thanking God for it and talking to God about it. And I just want to talk to others who are not followers of Jesus. And you, you, you say to me, you know, Rich, this promise is not for me. I'm not a Christian. You're right. It's not for you. God causes all things to work together for good to those who are his. But the good news is, is that you can have this promise be true of you by simple faith. By simply admitting your sin, believing that Jesus is God, come to earth, entering in, hum in the human body to die on the cross for your sins and rising again, and then committing yourself to him. And as I like to do, I'm just going to pray a prayer. And I want you to pray in the quietness of your heart. Some of you have been putting this off for a long time. You've heard me talk about this. You've heard the gospel presentation over and over and over again. Today's the day. Today's the day of salvation. 
trust him. Just pray with me. Lord Jesus, today I believe. I admit I'm a sinner. I'm separated from you because of that sin. And I'm sorry for my sin. I repent and I turn around from my sin. I place my faith in you, Jesus. The one who's God, the one who took my place on the cross and paid for the penalty of my sin and rose again. I give you my life. I trust you. And Lord, I pray that the peace that surpasses understanding would just flood that person, those people's hearts right now who prayed that simple prayer with me, and they would know with the rest of us that you, God, cause all things to work together for good to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so grateful that you could worship with us today and celebrate that we have a God who works all things for our good and that we can trust him with whatever is happening in our lives. We're all in this together and, and we have a website, hessel.org slash together. And if you want to talk to someone or have a specific need we can help you with, please go to hessel.org slash together and click on I need help. Uh, you can also click on I want to help to be a part of a team that helps others. We are also sending out encouraging daily devotions. If you would like to sign up to receive the devotions, just click on contact information. 15 minutes after this service, we're gonna have an all church online prayer service led by Pastor Rich and you are invited. Simply go to hessel.org slash together and click on online church prayer meeting at the bottom of the page. Uh, and if you want to share a specific prayer, please email your prayer request to prayer at hessel.org and we would love to pray for you and with you. Thank you again so much for worshiping with us and be sure to follow us on Facebook or Instagram to stay caught up with the latest news and encouraging content. And we hope that you have a great week.